first first events are always interesting, I have to say. There have been more <laughs> different technical difficulties here than I can count, but we've been able to overcome every one of them so far, one way or another. Maybe not the most optimal way, but getting past these has definitely uh, uh, shows some persistence. So one minute while I locate the video. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, uh, please leave them in the chat box to your rights. If you're on mobile, you probably do not have access to this. <clears throat> but I will do my best to answer all of your questions while this presentation is going on. My name is Ryan Orwig. I'm the creator of the StatMed Learning Program. I'm a reading and learning specialist, and I've helped hundreds of med students and doctors improve their test taking. So today, we're going to talk about how smart med students and doctors fail board exams. I can't tell you how many people ask me, why am I a bad test taker and how do I fix it? Specifically, they say things like, I do great clinically, but I can't translate what I know to exams. Or they say, I always narrow down to two and then pick the wrong one. Or maybe they say, I miss or distort the key clues and I don't trust myself. Or maybe they say, I'm always rushing to catch up and making unforced errors. The common theme here is that they realize they could have gotten a missed question right after they read the answer and explanation. If this is happening, what, 30% of the time? Three out of 10 missed questions? That's a lot. What if it's happening 40% of the time? 50%? That's catastrophic. Now, I'm not saying it's happening to everyone, of course, but I am saying bad test taking is real. And if it is happening to you, I want you to know there are absolutely ways to understand it on the one hand and then fix it on the other. So, when we talk about bad test taking on medical board exams, we're going to focus on five key elements in this lecture for why these types of tests are so hard for some of us. Issue number one is working memory. When we talk about working memory, we're talking about the sort of mental chalkboard where we solve problems. The capacity of this aspect of cognition is thought to be seven plus or minus two. Duration, 10 seconds, 60 seconds, somewhere in that range. And the thing about the design of the working memory is, as new information comes in, it overwrites that existing information. There's, there's no alert or warning that this is happening. It's just the nature of that particular beast. So the theory for the role of working memory and test taking goes something like this. Board's questions heavily burden working memory. Losing key clues makes wrong answers appear to be correct. This is part of this, uh, one of the key patterns we see with bad test taking. If your working memory is not robust, it can lead to increased issues with boards test taking. So this is my, my personal theory. I, don't, I can't say that there's research that absolutely supports this, but if you look at it holistically, it makes sense. So my theory is this, this old idea was the higher the IQ, the higher the working memory. So this idea that really smart people, they had nine, 10, 11 slots to hold in items. So, you know, a lot of our really brilliant med students and doctors, they have these robust working memories. They can hold on to all of this information. Well, what happens if your, if your working memory is average? You hold on to seven bits of information. It's average in the population in general, not, not the medical school population not the physician population. I mean, you can be okay, but I mean, still, it's still more burdensome for you when working these questions. And then what if you're on the low end, five, six working memory slots? It's going to make this act of navigating and, and, and processing these, these clinical vignettes that much harder. So I think as the testing mechanism for med school and for physicians has evolved, there's just been this sort of inadvertent expectation of robust working memory. So if you can hold on to all the information, that's good for you. You're probably a better test taker. I mean, there, there are ways where you might not be, but I think this is one of the key uh, aspects that we think about. And so if your working memory is average or below average, that's going to cause problems. So the solution 
is to install a test taking process that limits the burden on working memory. This is great for our folks with, with impaired working memories, with less robust working memories, but it's also good when your your overall processor is overloaded with you know being anxious, uh, being distracted, uh, not having the best reading strategies. So here's an example of what an overloaded working memory might look like while working a question. So let's say the question is asking, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? So as a med, st med student reads a board style question like this, his working memory fills up. So he's reading the, the, the paragraph, the passage, 36 year old female walks into your clinic. She's got severe left leg pain and back pain. Uh, started two days ago. She describes all the stuff of low back pain for years. The symptoms include bilateral paraspinal muscle spasms, decreased sensation on her left shin and her foot. You're reading this. You're, you know, you're working up your clinical diagnosis. You feel like you have an understanding of what's going on. Left foot, dorsiflexion is a three out of five. Now, this med student's working through this question. They don't know it, but their working memory is full at seven. So what happens is inadvertently, subconsciously, we have to scrub something. You're going to lose a key clue, and that clue is going to get replaced with something else. All straight leg test, pain at 40 degrees. Now, they just lost a random clue that happens to be that this is an acute injury that sort of goes along with a chronic issue. There's no alert, safeguard, or warning that this is happening. Now, the test taker either does not trust his knowledge or he feels tricked by the test maker once he misses the question, creating or perpetuating a vicious cycle. Therefore, we want to install a system that limits the burden on working memory, among other things. So I always tell the story when we talk about this. It's this idea of like, if you're this person, the more logical thing to do would be to say, okay, I'm a bad test taker. Let me go find the best test taker I can find and, and ask them what they're doing. Then I'm going to mimic that. I'm going to, I'm going to emulate that. This is what we do in life. But let me just say, like, going to the one who's the naturally best at something they might not be the best coach. The best players don't always make the best coaches uh, because they might do stuff innately or they might have robust working memories. So the story I always tell is a joke. It's, it's supposed to be funny. The idea is, um, so when I was a kid growing up in West Virginia, learning to play soccer back in the late 80s, early 90s, we didn't have all the stuff that my kids have here in West Virginia where um, they have expert coaches and, and all these online modules. So we just sort of figured it out ourselves. And... So when I got to high school, I didn't know how to properly strike a soccer ball. So we had this guy who was a senior, this big burly guy who could do amazing things, finishing the soccer ball, hitting it with placement, with power on the run. Uh, he knew how to bend it and all this stuff. So I got up the nerve to ask him how he kicks a soccer ball, how he shoots a soccer ball. And I didn't know if he was going to ridicule me, make fun of me, hang me on the fence post by my underwear. Who knows? This is a bleak, bleak era in our society when you could do that stuff. Anyway, so I asked him, I'm like, how, how do you shoot a soccer ball? And he puts his hand on my shoulder and he's like, oh, Ryan, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, let me tell you, what you need to do is you need to blast it. And I was like, blast it. He's like, yes, blast it. He like walks away. He's like, I changed that young man's life. It did not change my life. That's useless information. What I needed were mechanics. I wanted to know where my plant foot went. Uh, in relation to, you know, the ball, what surface of my foot I was striking with, where power came from, but I didn't even have the vocabulary to ask it. So the reason for that story is I think that when we're, maybe we're a bad test taker, we want to go ask that person that's really, really good at it. And they're often going to give you advice, but it, it very well might not line up with your particular needs. So we want to think about with this overloading of working memory, we want to install a system that's going to limit that burden. So the next thing we want to talk about is the reading sequence. What's the sequence you're using to read questions? There's no single right way to read and work questions. We call this the interface, how you as a person are interacting and interfacing with a question. What is your current interface? Where do you start? How do you navigate through a question? What do you do with the answer options? How do you manage them? And again, there's all kinds of ways you can do this. I just prefer a way that's going to limit burden on working memory. We want a process that limits the burden on working memory, among other things. First, let's define the three broad aspects of a board's question. I, I like to use my own vocabulary just to make sure we're all on the same page. I call the last sentence the prompt. 
Uh, it's the question being asked, single most important sentence, the sentence most likely to be overlooked, disregarded, or abused by uh, a test taker. The passage, that's everything above the prompt. That's clinical clues, the images, labs, any of that stuff. And then down below, we have our answer options. The way that I want to resolve issues with the prompt and resolve issues with working memory is install a system that limits burden on working memory. This is the simple version of it, okay? So we want to always start with the prompt. Last sentence, it's the precise question being asked. I think this is a pretty well-known piece of advice at this point. But I still talk to people all the time and they say, oh, I, I've heard about that. I do it sometimes, blah, blah, blah. I think a lot of people just read it just to like check mark it like I did it. But if you don't take advantage of each piece of it and become acutely aware of what it's actually asking, then it's probably for nothing. And then we want to read the passage, keeping the prompt in mind here and identifying three key clues on the other. It builds a sort of scaffold framework that just eases the burden on that working memory. And then I want us to take each answer option one by one, comparing it back to the specific question being asked, sort of asking how viable is this option? How viable is this? How viable is this? And what we're looking to do are actually rule out answer options instead of rule options in. Now, again, this can become a two hour conversation just talking about this process right here. But this is the basic architecture for reading questions. And I think it's a good thing for any bad test taker to start reshaping their strategy around something like this. And you'll notice I'm not leaving room for prediction, predicting the answer. Um, I think it's a, again, it's great advice for good test takers. If it works for somebody, wonderful. I don't want to mess with it. But if you're a bad test taker, if you have a bad relationship with these questions and not really trusting your knowledge, your ability to perform on these exams, I find this, oblig this obligatory feeling that so many of us have that we need to predict answers at this level to be negative. So I don't want us to really be worrying about predicting answers. The next issue is dealing with a binary mentality. So what does that mean? A binary test taking mentality. Binary test takers carry an absolutist all or nothing mentality into exams, thinking they need to know everything to get a question right. Binary test taking mentality is essentially fine in most standardized multiple choice first order questions, which is not how most of your boards are gonna be designed at this point. So an example of a first order multiple choice question, you know, something like who's the fifth president of the United States of America? Here, I might be better off predicting before I look at the answer options. That's James Monroe for those of you who care. Uh, which of the following is a first generation cephalosporin? Again, maybe I'm better off predicting on a first order and then just bang, hitting it, right? But if you're a bad test taker at the medical board's level, sort of carrying this mentality of, I need to know everything to get it right, or trying to predict an answer to try to work my way through, it's extremely damaging. The solution is to adopt the opposite mentality, which we call a partial knowledge mentality, where we use the parts of what we know to eliminate wrong options and choose from the best of what's left. Issue four is the prompt. So problems with the prompt. It explicitly states the precise question being asked. Look, if you're not answering the precise question being asked, you're, you're going to get yourself in trouble. I'll see people say, well, this isn't the most appropriate thing to do, but you could do it. Well, it's wrong. It's, it shouldn't be kept in play. Or, well, you wouldn't do it next, but you'd do it later. That's the wrong answer. But a lot of us want to keep it in play because it's related to the clinical scenario. The prompt is the most important sentence in the vignette, which is really weird because there's no real, you know, 25 cent medical words there. It's really easy just to glaze over that and good test takers really lock it in. The prompt should always be read first, and you should endeavor to refresh or check it while working the problem. So here are some common issues we see with the prompt. Number one is inaccurate retention. Reading the prompt first does not guarantee you will accurately know it by the time you are selecting your answer 30 or 75 seconds later. It could just be that it gets lost in the, uh, in the working of the question. It could be that the working memory flushes it out. It could be that it just drifts on you. It's a, it's a really dangerous thing. Some people will read the prompt first and then promptly forget it within seconds. It's like in one ear, out the other, Dory from Finding Nemo flittering by the screen here. Uh, some people read the prompt and reduce it to its most basic element and thus misread or misinterpret it. This is a very common uh, phenomenon that we see. It, look how short this prompt is. What is the best initial treatment? But our brains do strive to compress information. 
And so it's really easy for our brain to reduce it to what is the best treatment, sort of best overall broad spectrum type treatment. Both of those answers should be down there. Uh, and it's not the test trying to trick you. Um, it's trying to see, do you know the difference? But if you've lost sight of the question being asked, then you might spring that particular booby trap. Uh, some people will, re will read the prompt and then have it mutate in memory while reading. So the prompt is stating, st as stated might say, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? You would think that's pretty innocuous, but you know the brain is not going to operate in a in a vacuum without a question. It will auto create a question. But look, it might turn into which of the following is a possible way to manage this patient's condition. That's not the question being asked. And if you get unmoored or you jump that rail and you're answering them both at the same time or you're answering a question that's not the specific question being asked, you're opening yourself up for danger. So the scenario here, binary and prompt issues. So let's imagine we read a question. The prompt says, which of the following is the best initial treatment for this patient? I'm not even going to get into the dense clinical scenario because that's distracting. Let's just imagine it's a young woman with various issues coming to the clinic seeking diagnosis and treatment. And then we have our answer options. So this is based off of a student who was sent to me. He was a third year med student uh, sent to me because he'd failed two shelves in a row and they had sort of a zero tolerance policy on this stuff. And if he failed one more, he's out. And they were really confused. They said, look, this guy is brilliant. He, he, he destroyed his first two years, but now he's in rotations. He can answer any question you ask him, but we're talking like first, second, third percentile performances on these, on these shelves. Um, so what was going on with this guy? Well, either his knowledge just wasn't as good as it seemed, or there was a test taking problem and it turned out it was a test taking problem. He was a truly binary thinker in this, when it came to test taking, not clinically. We really wanna separate when we talk about clinical performance and test taking performance, they are not necessarily the same and certainly different with this guy. He was just used to knowing everything, simple as that. Usually being used to being the smartest guy in the room. So when he gets into these, these scenarios where he doesn't know every single thing, instead of using the parts of his knowledge to eliminate wrong answer choices and really locking on to the question being asked and really choosing the best of what's left, he was using his partial knowledge to narrow down the two and then kick away from the safer choice widening that gap. And he was doing it consistently, consistently, you know, in a damaging way. So here's, so, you know, the, I know that about him. We sit down, we do this question and here's what he does. He immediately narrows down to two options. He immediately knocks him down to B and D. He's like, oh, here we go again. I'm like, that's fine. Just go through it, go through it. So the way that we would sort of observe students, because remember, I've, if you didn't catch this, I'm a reading and learning specialist. I'm not a med student. I'm not a physician. So my entire 15 year history with this is sitting with med students and physicians, letting them talk and, and articulate their thoughts as they're working questions and then just taking notes on it. Like, mm, interesting, interesting. You're taking all this information and then you're collating it and finding these patterns. And that's what we found. We found these patterns over the years. So this guy narrows down to two options and he says about B and I'm just listening. Okay. So why do you like B? Remember, I don't know. I'm not going to give anything away. I'm just curious. Tell me what you think. He says, I'm pretty sure this is the first line. Well, that's cool. So I'm thinking in my head, well, you should probably pick it or give it a strong code. And then he says this, he's like, but you're like, oh no, don't do it. I also know it's not the best thing, not as effective as he's like flexing on his knowledge a little bit. And it's like, it doesn't really matter. So what do you think about D then? Well, I know it's the better drug, generally, broadly speaking, but it's prednisone first line treatment, question mark. He doesn't know. He's saying, I don't know if it's first line. Eh, I like prednisone better to treat this fake patient, right? So he picks D. It's the wrong answer. And lo and behold, yep, B was correct. You know, he says, I always narrow down to two and pick the wrong one. Uh, the patterns of play are, he tried to answer two prompts at the same time, ultimately answering what is the best overall treatment. He chose the option that he knew most about overall, but based on an aspect he didn't know about it. He knew more about prednisone, especially in, in, in general and in relation here, except he didn't know this one piece. He didn't know if it was the, you know, if it was first line or not. So he sort of ignored that. He knew less about B, but the things he knew fit better. And then he kicked, but he kicked away from it. He did not choose the thing that he knew that most closely connected back to the prompt. And what his brain did was it allowed him to fudge what it was asking, best initial treatment to best overall treatment. That fit his perceived knowledge on prednisone better. Oh, I asked him, I said, is this a knowledge or test taking miss? And he says, this is a 
knowledge miss. And I was like, you know, my head hit the, the, the table. I was like, what? He's like, no, no, listen. He's like, if I had known that one extra thing about prednisone, or if I knew one more thing about endomethacin in, in, in regard to this patient, I would have picked it. And I don't care about that. I don't care about that at all. Because you know who doesn't care about that? The day he sits down and takes his USMLE or his, or his shelf exam, uh, and, and, he, and he doesn't get the question right. And it, it's, it's an indifferent uh, mechanism, right? There's no partial credit. Uh, what I care about is, could he have gotten this question right using proper prescribed methodology? And the answer is 100% yes. He should have picked B 10 times out of 10 based on exactly what he knew. He narrowed it down to, I think that B is first line. I don't know if D is first line for this situation. Should have picked B 10 times out of 10. And that's how we know it's a test taking mess. And that's what he got better with. And that's how he overcame his issues. And that's how he's a physician today. So the final thing I want to talk about is the twisting of key clues. So inferences are good. This is the lifeblood of good reading and certainly the lifeblood of when you're dealing with second and third order questions. Inferences are when the test taker draws logical conclusions from the clues presented in the passage, in the vignette, or in the clinical scenario. The overwhelming majority of test takers can be expected to draw these conclusions. That's how it works. The, the flip side of this are what we call twists. This is where you make the square peg fit in the round hole. They're bad. Twists are when the test taker draws conclusions from the clues in the question that are not logical and they are not universal. They often require the insertion or deletion of other words, ideas, or concepts. Insertion usually uses linking phrases like what if or but maybe. And this allows us to add clues that aren't there. And then it's tries, we're, we've turned the equation of 10 plus 10 into 10 plus 10 plus 2. Where everyone else is saying 10 plus 10 is, is 20. If, you're, if you've added a plus 2, you're confidently picking 22 and, and you're wrong. Deletion usually means condensing a detailed phrase into a single word or two, which causes us to lose a key meaning. Now, this can really be an expression of working memory overload, but we can sort of, just for the sake of this conversation, think of it as a twist. So I'm going to give you two scenarios to wrap this thing up. So here we have an example with extreme examples of twisting. This is a true story. Uh, or you read the prompt, which of the following, which part of the patient's history should you be most concerned about? That's an ugly prompt. You're not going to see something like this on a, on a national board exam, but you still have to learn how to get your uh, language alert up and say, wait, that's weird. Let me sort of understand what that's asking. Then you read through your passage, maybe picking out three key clues. 15 year old female is brought to your clinic by her father because she fainted twice during workouts with her new personal trainer last week. So fainting and then how, however you want to interpret that. She's unconcerned about the incidence of syncope and says her father was overreacting because she felt fine before and after the events. The patient appears normal and she did not denies using any medications or illegal drugs. Which part of the patient's history should you be most concerned about? So again, I'm not interested in predicting, but maybe what I want to do is say, well, what are my three key clues up here? And I want to make sure I understand what the prompt is asking me. And then I want to go through A, B, C, D, E, one by one, focusing on results of any previous pulmonary function tests, sort of like a an asthma type stuff, I guess. Family history, what would that show me? How might that match up with the patient's history, which, which part of the patient's history should I be most concerned about? Sexual activity, should I? how might that fit the clinical scenario? Travel history, how might that fit? Information about her diet, how might that fit? So here is how a really reckless test taker read this. And this is a true story. So he reads very fast, top down. Okay, he doesn't you know, look at the prompt. He just runs through it, 15 year old female clinic, She's fainting, and basically by the second line, he's like, oh, I know what's going on here. She's pregnant. I see it all the time. I see it every day. She's climbing out her window at night, climbing down the trellis, getting in her boyfriend's pickup truck. She's pregnant. She's lying. She's lying because that's what teenage girls do. She's pregnant. Boom. See. Done. Nailed it. And that's, a, that's a frighteningly close to a verbatim uh, a recollection of that story. Um, so that's bad. You know, he sees these, these few clues. Denies drugs use, use. So he uses denies drugs and is like, what about her sexual activity? I see all the time, right? It's not a great triangulation. It doesn't even really read the really read the prompt. Answer C, it's wrong. In fact, the right answer is B, family history. Okay. So the question is, could he have gotten this right? If no, it's a knowledge miss. But if yes, it's a test-taking miss. This is the always the initial determination I think anybody should make, if you're worried about your test taking process, it should always be an analysis and a determination of, okay, I see what I did. I read the answer explanation. 
could I have found my way to getting it right? If, if you just didn't know enough, then forget it. It's a knowledge miss. But if you could have, you need to see what steps you took wrong and what steps you could have taken to get it right. So reading the answer and explanation, he clearly sees he was answering a different question, not the question being asked, right? He also acknowledges that feigning during exertion is not a key sign of pregnancy and better pregnancy clues are absent, much less obviously he added all kinds of stuff. So when you miss it, we have to model through how should you have read it? What steps should you have taken? So he's like, I should have started the prompt. It's not asking what could be causing this. It's asking what's the thing that you should be, you should find out first and foremost when you see these very limited symptoms. Pick three clues. What are the key three clues here? Well, we got this in her age, fine, gender. Uh, fainted twice during personal training session. What does that mean? That means she's fainted twice during intense cardiovascular workouts. She felt fine before and after the events. And during is a key word here. If you just think of it as her going somewhere, that's wrong. Uh, and then you have to weigh the options individually. Would have pointed to the right answer, must rule out family history of heart issues to see if hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a risk. Given the limited clues, fainting multiple times during exertion, this must be considered first and foremost. The conclusion is, since this process would lead to a correct answer, it's a test taking miss, must meticulously trace these proper steps to modify test taking behaviors because here's the deal. Bad test taking is bad behavior. So it's one thing to understand what you're doing right and wrong. That's the first step. And that comes through this act of self-reflection. But then you have to really train consistently and rigidly with it to train new behaviors to overwrite the bad behaviors. Now, here's the last example, and it's a more subtle scenario for twisting. So we start by reading the prompt first. The most likely diagnosis is... So that means we can read it, read it a little faster, a little looser, looking for key clues. 30-year-old male comes to ED complaining of muscle weakness in his right leg. He started feeling poorly after returning from a trip abroad a week ago, where he reports he swam in various rivers and lakes. We always want to pay attention to timeline. He has also experienced malaise, nausea, and muscle spasms since returning home, and the muscle weakness has continued to worsen. So again, we're seeing this progression. Evaluation reveals increased WBC and mildly elevated protein levels in CSF, most likely diagnosis. So again, then we want to take each option one by one and make a determination between Guillain-Barre, geodesis, MS, Addison's, and poliomyelitis. So here's how somebody might miss this question, a little more subtle. So he's a binary test taker, reads a passage, and gets thrown off since the answer does not jump off the screen at her. She likes to know answers, hard to believe for our med students and physicians, and she secretly wants that answer to jump out and get her, and she, it doesn't. Again, sort of that expectation of predicting and knowing the answers, it's not happening. And that's okay if you can keep your wits about you. And she doesn't here, okay? She weighs each option individually, so she's behaving generally good, but you'll see it falls off. She looks at A, Guillain-Barre, yes, maybe, because of what muscle weakness in the legs. She likes muscle weakness in the legs for Guillain-Barre. Pay attention to that. Because that's not really what it says. And she says, she says, yes, maybe, because he was swimming in rivers and lakes abroad. So who knows what was in there? Could get something like Giardia there, which is, I guess, okay. She's not really asking about the clue. She's trying to rule Giardia in instead of trying to rule it out. C, no symptoms, so it doesn't fit. Same thing. And then with E, no, seems like a ridiculous option. Should be vaccinated. Don't know much about this, so strikes it out. Maybe not the best reason to rule it out. So now she's tied between A and B. Then chooses A because she realizes the main symptoms of Giardia are absent, so she doesn't really doesn't really fit. Okay, fair. So now she picks the, this answer, and it turns out it's wrong, and it turns out that the correct answer is indeed E. Now, on the surface, this certainly looks like a knowledge miss, but step-by-step -step analysis will better inform us and help sort out any test-taking issues. Sometimes even a question you couldn't get right might teach you something about bad test-taking, or it might show you that you should have gotten it right. So here, missteps taken while working this question. So she twisted by reducing muscle weakness in right leg to leg weakness, then which sort of defaulted to bilateral leg weakness in her head. And the key here is if you ask her, GBS, unilateral or bilateral? She was like, definitely bilateral. Like, I know that. So had she not lost that clue, she strikes out GBS, the wrong answers that she chose. And now all of a sudden, it's a different ballgame. Did not identify three key clues, twisted the rivers and lakes to make Giardia fit when no symptoms really matched. Using proper reading of the passage, she could have weighed each option individually, emphasizing the ruling out instead of ruling in. So A could have been out, bilateral, not unilateral. B, out, none of the symptoms fit. 
again, you know, C and D out. Now down to E, I don't even know. I don't know anything about it. I mean, I, you know, but you can't rule it out. So even though it's a slash, 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 slash question mark, she should have been able to pick E with confidence and say, bang, nailed it. Because I know I've, I know enough about the other four to rule them out. They can't be most likely. Therefore, this was a test taking miss. So in conclusion, why am I a bad test taker and how do I fix it? If you identify as a bad test taker on medical board exams, there's likely a reason why. You are repeating the same three to five mistake patterns over and over and over. This might not apply to you, but it might apply to students you work with, friends of yours, other people you know. And it's just good to open our minds up to this, that it's not always a direct translation of what people know. This lecture may help entangle your issues and get you moving in the right direction regarding your test taking. This absolutely can give you a framework and some guidelines. However, if it only scratches the surface, feel free to look into our StatMed board's workshop to address test taking issues. And we also offer our StatMed class to learn better study methods. I hope you found this lecture useful and informative. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank you for watching. Stay safe. Oh, <laughs>